Starting this video, we'll look at some definitions from <clears throat> a law dictionary, revised and enlarged edition, adapted to Constitution and laws of the United States of America and of the several states of the American Union, with references to the civil and other systems of foreign law by John Bouvier, or Bouvier, however you would say that. Uh, and it's hard to read these letters down there, which appear to be in French and Latin anyway. 14th edition, revised and greatly enlarged, volume 2, mark, date marked 1874, Philadelphia, J.B. Lippincott and Company. In this document, we are going to look at the definition of the word lawful, where it states legal, that which is not contrary to law, that which is sanctioned or permitted by law, that which is in accordance with law. The terms lawful, unlawful, and illegal are used with reference to that which is in its substance sanctioned or prohibited by the law. <clears throat> now, it gives a different note here that more accurately defines the term legal. The term legal is occasionally used with reference to matters of form alone. Thus, an oral agreement to convey land, though void by law, is not properly to be said to be unlawful because there is no violation of law in making or in performing such an agreement, but it is said to be not legal or not in lawful form because the law will not enforce it for want of that written evidence required in such cases. So here, under the definition of lawful, you get an understanding that the term legal though mis- and incorrectly used in many circumstances, such as using illegal in the place of lawful, is in fact defined as reduced to writing. However, under the definition for legal in this 1874 edition, a heavily revised 14th edition, of course, of le uh, lawful definition or law, a law dictionary, under legal it states that which is according to law it is used in opposition to equitable, as a legal estate is in the trustee, the equitable estate in the sestu k trust. That would be, as far as I understand it, him that trust, but trust being the Latin here, and uh, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the original use of that word was. And I'm not even sure sestu k is accurate, but k is what in Spanish, French, and Portuguese, and also Italian, so that likely does mean was. what. Sestu apparently means who, but, or whom, but I'm not entirely sure about that one either. Hey, but see Powell Mortgage Index. So there's clearly some screwiness going on here and how these words have been obfuscated, usurped, uh, pushed into various different ways, twisted, so that those that use them do not actually comprehend or understand that they're using them incorrectly or not because in the definitions it appears to be accurate. But even in this document, in this book, under lawful definition, you actually get the definition for legal. So, yes, there's something strange going on here. Now, who did this? According to Wikipedia, the ABA was founded on August 21st, 1878 in Saratoga Springs, New York by 75 lawyers from 20 states and District of Columbia. According to the ABA website, the legal profession, as we know today, barely exists at that time. That's a lie. But it's twisted here. The legal profession as we know it today barely exists at the time. What they're referencing here is a monopoly. What we have today in the legal profession is a monopoly on the ability to write, quote unquote, document or, or uh, laws, uh, actions in law, reduced to writing. Essentially, that's what we're looking at. They have, they put into place a monopoly, and that's what we see today. And monopolies barely existed at the time. That's what they're saying. We we might read it differently because we're trained to. Anyway, lawyers were generally practitioners trained under a system of friendship. As it should. Now you have monopoly on where one entity controls it and you have to get licensed with them, otherwise they're thugs uh, from the pretend governments come at after you. So this would basically be the same idea as a writer's group, a uh, who's a club of writers who give dance to various uh, authors and what and sleeve this and put in whatever it doesn't have that entity says try or they just they dance to war or war like that. And then that group comes along and says, We are the sole entity that can determine who can practice the craft of writing, right? Write, like fiction, like writing fiction, you know. It sounds rather uh, amazing and impractical and uh, just improbable, but that's exactly what happened here. 
you have a group, foreign group, mind you, from coming from Britain, but the American version of it, that comes in and says, we have the sole discretion on who gets to practice legal profession. And then they expanded that to become law profession. Anything at all that has relates to activities going and in, in, uh, having to do with law, that person has to be licensed by them. And they are, in fact, an association for the legal profession, meaning the writers of documents. Originally, a term was used, which is less used nowadays, called a jurist. According to Wikipedia, a jurist is a person with expert knowledge of law, someone who analyzes and comments on law. This person is usually a specialist legal scholar, that just means studies writing, mostly with a formal qualification in law and often a legal pr practitioner. Well, that's nowadays. However, the jurist is an all-encompassing term talking to somebody who engages in the profession of law, in which the legal profession is simply a subset of that. So that's very important to distinguish it. Now we know who or who, and now we know uh, what. What did they, they submit law to over maple and over trade of doing the practice trade, right? And they are the bar association. Now we look at to who we look at this actual license civil high federal high corporation section of high C corporate system under law Delaware under West and Street Woman Dark Cuyahoga Cleveland is in the county city village or township which is principal office when the state will be located David W Donnelly uh, that's the address given there Union Trust Building it's obviously not a uh, personal address it's a business address just now registering uh, there is herewith submitted a copy of the applicants. Articles of incorporation, including all amendments, thereto certified by the proper official of the state under the laws of which the application is organized. And we're going to look at that just after this document. Now, this is dated August 1936 from the state of New Jersey, County of Hudson. So, yes, you have a lot of interesting elements going on here. Under Articles of Corporation for this entity, it states, To serve members of the bar of this state or any other state and foreign country in any lawful manner. Any lawful manner. That just means that they'll form the manner of law, and that can be any manner. So their purpose is in order in... in um, a simple sense, it's just to appear as being lawful, meaning any lawful manner. Not actually following the law, but looking like. Anyway, in the organization, registration, and qualification of corporations, domestic, and foreign. And all this is says, and it does stipulate foreign countries. So we're not talking foreign states, we're saying this no. entity which controls a large portion of things in the United States is doing this on behalf of, in fact, foreign countries. Anyway, it states to represent corporations, domestic and foreign, in a statutory capacity, to establish and maintain for corporations, domestic and foreign, principal and registered offices, to act as or furnish the agent for corporations, domestic and foreign, upon whom process may be served and to carry on a general service agency basis. So this is the structure or group that makes the juridical entities that rule us today in the name of government, where in fact we the people do not control them, foreign investors do. To secure, publish, and distribute in letter, bulletin, journal, digest, or other form information with respect to court decisions, statutory requirements, and provisions, uh, official and departmental rulings, regulations, and requirements, and legislative proceedings of the government of the United States, or any or all of the states, districts, territories, or colonies, notice that word there, colonies, of the United States of America and of the Dominion and Provinces of Canada, other foreign countries res with respect to the organization and corporation maintenance of corporate, domestic, and foreign. This is your, essentially, your government. And they're all paper pushers. They, this whole entity is formed to serve the paper pushers, the, the quote-unquote legal professionals that establish a monopoly, and this is how they do it. They have this entity to go around their minions to go around forming documents, what we would call essentially forgery. But we will look into the exact forgery element later in this video. So now we have a good understanding of the who 
and the what. Now we have to go look at the how and the why. To get an idea of this, we'll go and look at a magazine, the commercial, Wilmington, North Carolina, Saturday, March 11th, 1854. Now, here's the why in one little blurb. Claims of the heirs of Lafayette. The heirs of General Lafayette have brought suit to recover several hundred acres of land, having a front of 600 yards beyond the old fortifications at New Orleans. This is a portion of the 11,520 acres of land granted to Lafayette by Congress. Now, that doesn't state anything here about heirs having a legitimate claim to land that was granted is what it says here, but who knows how true that is, to an individual. Now, you won't find any of the documents for this, and most of the documents that you all find are, are clearly a, a newer, a newly made, or at least dated, made from a date that they were backdated to. So, fraud, basically, forged. And if you look this up, you'll only get comments from people of now, of current times. But what this sounds like to me, and what people would probably read it as, is what we know of as the Prince of Nigeria scam, which is something that most people know about today, and if they saw it, most people would laugh about it, but might actually become something in the future considering how these schemes operate and how they take uh, often decades, often centuries to implement, sometimes even longer. Anyway, riots on the Pacific Railroad. The laborers on the Pacific Railroads near St. Louis have lately been concerned in a series of riots. Some of the overseers have been whipped. One or two of the contractors threatened with violence and citizens and property along the line depredated upon. And worse than all, several persons have been found murdered on the road. That, of course, is a section that would immediately jump out at you normally with most people. And you would just gloss over, maybe laugh a little bit about that section above it. Of course, it's not a laughing matter now, but at the time, nobody would have taken that top one seriously, and then the second one would have distracted them from it, the one about the murders below it or riots on the Pacific Railroad. Also, another interesting note in this document, $1,000 found. On Friday, a gentleman lost in Pearl Street, $1,000 in city bills. They're not talking about uh, a bill as in a list of things. They're talking about what we would term nowadays legal tender or... Uh, uh, bills of exchange, right? That's what they're talking about. And that goes to the idea that in the past, there were in fact many institutions that printed bills and the United States government mint actually only printed or rather minted uh, metal coins of silver and gold, which were then deposited with banks and other and whatnot for printed paper money that would hold the place of that. There was no quote-unquote national paper currency. That's not a thing that we're supposed to have, but we do. Anyway, for recovery of which an advertisement was put in the Herald with but small hopes of ever again seeing this money, but in his surprise and pleasure on the following morning, Miss McBright, who keeps a crockery store, 24-7 First Avenue, entered the store where the money was to be left and returned it to the grateful owner, New York Herald. That's probably a lie. I don't know if it's true, but the reference to city bills is certainly interesting there. Now, Wayne County, it states, a meeting of farmers and other persons interested in the advancement of agriculture assembled at the courthouse in Goldsboro on the 27th. George W. Collier, or Collier, probably say Collier, was called to the chair and G.O.V. Strong and W.H. Gulick were appointed secretaries, W.K. Lane, at the call of the chair stated that the object of the meeting was to form an agricultural society for the county of Wayne. Dr. S.A. Andrews, chairman of committee appointed for that purpose, reported resolutions embracing the object in view and measures, uh, I think that's measures, M-E-S-S-R-S, -S -S? typo. W.T. Dorch, W.K. Lane, S.A. Andrews, J. Everett, and G.O.V. Strong were appointed to committee to draft resolutions and bylaws for the society. At the time, that might not have looked at such as such a big deal, but nowadays, since we understand the heavy-handed nature of these associations doing the bidding of foreign investors, of course, uh, uh, this was, in fact, a very big deal that was probably looked over at the time. Also, that doctor there, I don't know if that's the same doctor the way we use it today, uh, considering the fact that the doctors of now would not have been the doctors of then. You probably didn't. You could probably just be a doctor as in a medical doctor by practicing and people 
uh, believed in your practice. They had a, a faith in it. They went to you as a businessman. You didn't have any quote unquote licensing or leave to practice from some sort of monopolist against you that controls the trade, uh, all backed by the <clears throat> legal. Uh, document writing association that took over basically everything. Right underneath, underneath this is a interesting element that sort of jumps out at you, especially considering the way it's worded, but then is kind of brushed aside at the end of it. The body of a, a Hilliard Reed, a free mulatto. Mulatto, of course, as we're taught, means mixed, but who knows if that's entirely true, who had been employed on board the railroad company steamer was found this morning floating in the Northeast River just above the company's wharves. We learned that when last seen, he was quite drunk and probably is that he fell into the river and got drowned while in a state of intoxication. Journal of Thursday. Now, here's another section that seems to link to that other one, even though they're not put together. A letter from Copenhagen says the police of this city publishes every year an account of the number of persons found drunk in the streets. In the year 1851, the number of men taken up drunk was 591 and of women 150. A total which gives an increase of 73 over 1850 and of 92 over 1849. Now, this sounds exactly like the scheme that they put forward today where they use uh, suicide as a cover for uh, murder, basically. And in that time, they would have used drunkenness as a cover for murder. And, uh, of course, nowadays, they have all of their statistics and numbers and things that come from everywhere to give validity to the claim. And you're not supposed to question it as in a certain individual who everybody says did not kill himself. Now, here we get into the main, the main uh, concept in this video about how this essentially paper forgery was conducted in which a large mechanism would put in place to forge documents essentially take over through paper, right? Not, not a, a, a general land army, but paperwork. Paperwork was the takeover. And in order to do this, they have to first clear the way for their fraudulent documents by erasing essentially wiping the slate clean, taking away all of the old documentation, removing it, in one way or another. So let's go ahead and look how they did that. According to this magazine, uh, newspaper again, the Harpers, we very much regret to learn that Harper and Brothers were among the losers by the fire in Spruce Street, New York. On Sunday morning, since the destruction of their establishment, they have had considerable of their work done by Mr. S.W. Benedict, the publisher, and about 15,000 worth of their materials being on Mr. B's premises at the time of the fire was consumed. Also from this newspaper, Destructive Conflagration in Boston, Boston, March 31st. It's important to notice their twisting of the words and use of different words here and there for fire. These conflagration, in another part they use fire, and another part they might use flame. They might use any number of different words so that it can later in the future be twisted and uh, distorted so that people can't go back and look these things up or realize what they're looking for. Anyway, Boston, March 31, and remember this is the 1850s. At 10 o'clock this morning, the Tremont Temple, formerly the theater, was discovered to be on fire, and in less than two hours afterwards was a mass of ruins. The walls all fell in. The loss is stated at 200. I do believe that's 200,000. The building was insured for 42,000 in eastern offices and was occupied by 80 tenants of various professions who lost all their property. A.J. Johnson, music dealer, losing pianos alone, 8000 Uh Toast Thompson, valuable collection of pewters. Pewters, I'm not sure what that is worth. 45000 was destroyed. King, the artist, loses his beautiful bust of Webster and other valuable paintings and works of art belonging to different tenants were destroyed. The building adjoining the south side was completely smashed by the falling ruins. April 1st, 1852, started as a pleasant but windy spring day in the city of Chillicothe. By day's end, two city blocks of homes and businesses were in ashes, an uncontrollable inferno quickly spread devastating to the downtown area. The Great Conflagration in Philadelphia on Tuesday, July 9th, 1850, Library of Congress. The first great fire in Philadelphia's history began in the afternoon of July 9th, 1850, at a warehouse on the east side of Water Street between Vine and Ray Streets, near the Vine Street Wharf on the Delaware River. The fourth great fire broke out about 4 o'clock in the morning, of September 17th, 1850. This time, the, uh, that's missing something, was estimated to be only 250,000. The blocks burned over between DuPont, Montgomery, Washington, and Pacific Streets. This from the early history of San Francisco Fire Department.
This day in history, according to the Sacramento History Museum, on this day in 1852, November 2nd, Sacramento's great fire, known as the Great Conflagration, burned more than 80% of the structures in the city. The structures were mainly made of canvas and wood. We come to another newspaper called Wilmington Journal, and this dated uh, later, but does reference the uh, 1849 Reminiscence of a Californian number four. The Great Fires, California, must not be blah, blah, blah. The tire, or I'm not I'm sure, uh, it looks like tire, probably not the way we'd use it, of the 24th December, 1849, which had swept away a oh, fire. <laughs> Duh. which had swept away more than a million dollars worth of property, had hardly cooled ere new buildings were again in the process of erection on the burnt district. But in four months from this time, 4th of May, 1850, the second great fire commenced in nearly the same locality, destroyed property to the amount of four millions of dollars. With still more energy than was displayed after the first conflagration, when once... Went to men went to work, and in an incredibly short space of time, the Bird District was covered with new buildings, even while the smoke could still be seen rising from the fire unquenched and smoldering in many localities of the Blackened District. So the the object here primarily was to clear the way of old documents, specifically in relation to the land, so that way they could forge new ones and backdate them, and no one would be the wiser because so much was destroyed in all of these destructive fires. Now, in the, after and during the Civil War, the focus was put on the South because in the 1850s, they did all of their due diligence at work in the North, and obviously in California. Probably Portland and uh, Washington states as well, if they were even called them that. But basically, they went around torching the documents and the areas with documents that they could, any hubs and whatnot. And then, after when the Civil War kicked off, they went through the South and burned and destroyed all the evidence there. So that way, they could pave the way for their new enterprise of the American Bar association to come in and take everything over through a sweeping wave of forged documents essentially we'll go ahead and look at some patterns of document forgeries that had wide and sweeping impacts and we still feel the impacts of today considering who runs things and the fact that they run things through in fact more and more forgeries treaty of tordesillas is still not considered a forgery and it was allegedly according to wikipedia signed in Tordesillas, Spain, on the 2nd of June, 1494, and ratified in Setubal, Portugal, divided the newly discovered lands outside Europe between Portugal and the crown of Castile, along a median 370 west degrees of Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa. Now, what this little blurb doesn't tell you, which it should, is that they divided the entire globe, the whole world, between Spain and Portugal, and this was presided over by the Pope. So they forged this document, probably, in order to cause chaos, war, and strife on purpose. Because I could not imagine Spain and Portugal doing something like this, at least legitimately. So this is probably forgeries, and the crowns were uh, compromised then, as they are now, as far as I'm aware. Because you had a lot of and heavy... Uh, influence of the Habsburgs, who eventually got kicked out and uh, re-legitimate rule imposed, which was then, of course, kicked out and the same people were put back in place through document forgeries and, and fraud and, and usurpations of criminal nature and whatnot. Anyway, they won't say this document is a forgery and because it is still in use today, and if they did say it was a forgery, then they would essentially be uh, shooting themselves in the foot. They're not going to do that, and they control mainly all of the communication outlets so they wouldn't allow this document to be even seen as a forgery. But we will go ahead and look at other ones, and we will get a pattern of what we're looking here. At, le at the very least, this document is illegitimate and clearly made to cause conflict. Donation of Constantine. Donation of Constantine is a forged Roman imperial decree by which the 4th century emperor Constantine the Great supposedly transferred authority over Rome in the western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. Yeah, big surprise there. They are still operating under that forged document or otherwise they believe they rule the world as part of the universalist structure of the universal church and the universal rulers etc yeah.
Now, this is also not considered a forgery, although in many cases you can look at this and say it's most likely a forgery because it's pretty ridiculous if you think about it. In the Bible, in Genesis 41, 37 through 57, a New Living Translation, Joseph is made ruler of Egypt because he was able to, according to them, translate a dream. <laughs> That's quite, quite amazing. Quite an amazing story. I mean, they, they have made us believe that through the cudgel of the church, universal church structure, and they could basically force us to believe anything, but this stuff is really quite ridiculous when you think about it. It states, And whenever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down, so Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I'm Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Yeah, that's highly improbable. That sounds like all the other crap that they make up and the other stupid excuses to uh, state why they own things, when in fact the practical uh, method behind it is really quite simple. Very wicked and evil, but it's just plain old fraud. Now, in Levantine Adventure, Travels and Missions of Chevalier de Rue, 1653-1697 by W.H. Lewis, Warren H. Lewis, we will look at an example from the 16th century, so after dated after all of these other uh, examples we looked at, Except, of course, for the one from the Americas, in which a description of some of the most heinous acts when it comes to imperson imper uh, imp impersonation, fr false impersonation of a very high, high nature, very high class, basically high treason, um, and a whole bunch of other crimes is... Uh, a certain entity who we're mostly more aware of today than we might have been in the past, but you're not supposed to name them, apparently, because YouTube, um, was found out to have committed, basically, yeah, let's, go, let's look at that. It's quite amazing. On page 197, matters had rested thus until DuPont's reign, and he, knowing that the nation wrote unceasingly to Versailles, begging for his dismissal, threw himself into the hands of the... Uh, G-Man, -G J-Man, call him a J-Man, which is funny because Jew and, and J-Man and the J word that you're not supposed to say uh, kind of seem to run together. Anyway, J-dressed person and implored their protection, which he got at a price. Father Basson, S-J, who thought that DuPont had the makings of a useful servant of the society, volunteered to act as his secretary. Ha ha ha. He wrote all his official letters for him, and as he was a man of ability, they were good ones, and hid DuPont's inefficiency from Colbert, who was thus fooled completely. We have a word for that. But the easiest one, of course, is fraud. Then came a demand for the first installment of payment for services rendered. The Franciscan chaplain to the consul was also the parish cur, or curé, and the jes uh, jesmen caused... DuPont to replace him as chaplain by a J-man, while leaving him undisturbed in the office of parish priest. By immemorial custom, the curé was the arbiter in any dispute between the consul and a Frenchman, and soon after this, the curé made an award which ran counter to DuPont's wishes. DuPont, in collusion with the J-man, retaliated by reporting to Versailles that the Franciscans were Spaniards. Enemies of the king did not offer the customary prayers for him, and that he was dismissing them from his chapel. So far, so good, thought the J-men. But DuPont, who was already finding their rule galling, suddenly swung round and offered his chaplaincy to the Capuchins. But the J-men were not to be so easily shaken off as DuPont had hoped. Perhaps he had forgotten that Louis XIV's confessor was, in fact, a J-man. But if so, he was soon reminded of the fact by the arrival home from home of letters patent preserving the office of consular chaplain to the Society of J-men. I'm not going to use that other word, which just means I am the French je suis. But without prejudice to the right of the parish curé to say the parish mass in the consular chapel. So there we get a plain description of fraud practiced by the usual culprits and the people behind all this other crap. As per usual, they come from a very suspicious place that people are becoming more and more aware of in its full uh, creepy and uh, evil implications. If you have liked this video, please uh, like it, 
share it, uh, subscribe to my channels, uh, join my newly formed Discord, and there are free books available, the links, and if you so desire, you may, may support my work at any of the options available, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, etc. Thank you.